The face of the earth has been lifted, eroded, and reformed countless times, and the evidence is written in the rocks left behind. In some places, this change happens slowly, but others imply a cataclysm, like this sloping sea cliff behind us. On the bottom is a mudstone, overlaid with a thick white layer of marine sediment. What's striking is the lack of intermediate rock between the two conditions. It's as if one day, a slow-moving river turned into an ocean. Junctions like this are called unconformities, and when two kinds of rock are dated, either using radiometric methods or stratigraphic fossil evidence, geologists usually find missing time. In this specific case, the mudstone is dated to 5 million years ago, while the marine terrace deposits are perhaps just 20,000 years old. Where'd all that rock go? Now is probably a good time to mention that a lot of the dates that we're putting forward have been assumed from various indirect methods, especially radiometric techniques. These involve critical assumptions that are worth a whole video in the near future, so take these dates with a grain of salt. However, it's enough to think of the geologic history as a relative history of events, and we'll unpack the methods used to find that out in a later video. All right, back to the cliff. Unconformities are thought to be the result of gradual changes, erosion from the rise and fall of the sea, changing climate, or wandering rivers slowly erasing the rock record. This uniformitarian perspective is at the heart of modern geology, to the degree that many think it should be a first principle of the field. The problem is, standing here on the coast of California, it seems entirely possible that tectonic activity changed these rocks very suddenly. It hardly registers as a bold claim, since within living memory we've seen that a single earthquake can shift coastlines. We've also seen that massive tsunamis are capable of eroding away meters of rock and sand in a single day, all of which suggests that the California coast was formed by a uniform process only in the aftermath of periodic catastrophes. The same logic should be applied to much, much larger unconformities, like the Great Unconformity at the Grand Canyon, where a rip in the rock layers suggests an unthinkable cataclysm. 6,000 feet below the canyon rim, the Colorado River runs through a narrow canyon that's bored through metamorphic rock. The crystalline structure of the rocks there suggests they formed more than six kilometers underground. But today, there's only a few hundred feet of rock that stands over the river before the canyon walls change to a flat but durable sandstone. Even more astonishing is that the basement layer, the Vishnu Schist, is pre-Cambrian rock. It was laid down when the Earth was still a water world, inhabited only by single-celled organisms desperately trying to get a handle on the new presence of oxygen on the planet. The Tapete Sandstone, on the other hand, the rock that lies unconformably on these basement rocks, dates to much later. It's the Paleozoic time, and it's dotted with the fossils of trilobites, snails, and shellfish. What happened between these two layers? This same gap between the Precambrian and Cambrian rocks makes us think that whatever happened here set the stage for the world as we know it. What's most mind-blowing is that there's still no conclusive answer about what kind of event is capable of shaving a mountain range the size of the Himalayas down to a flat surface on which a shallow sea can form. To put some options on the table, we're going to explore some of the non-uniformitarian events that could have obliterated kilometers worth of geologic records worldwide and perhaps simultaneously remodeled the Earth into something hospitable for the plants and animals that we find everywhere today. It's a story full of sunshots, big bangs, and all scales of fantastical chaos. So buckle up folks, because we're about to produce some pretty far out possibilities. The existence of a continuous fossil record between the Paleozoic and Neoproterozoic leads some to suggest that the Great Unconformity wasn't actually a planet-wide event. But all Precambrian fossils come from watery environments, so it's entirely possible that a global catastrophe cooked, scoured, and shattered the entire surface of the planet, which allowed only those creatures that lived at the bottom of the ocean or in the deep, hot biosphere to survive. Both standard theories about the formation of the Great Unconformity have issues. The Snowball Earth theory says that thick glaciers covered the entire planet and ground whole mountain ranges into dust, but it doesn't deal with the aforementioned continuous rock record, or the fact that there's 3.5 billion year old mountain ranges that totally escaped destruction. What, did they have a catastrophe passport or something? 
Rodinia-based theories say continental drift shaved the mountains flat, which doesn't account for the theories that suggest any kind of plate movement, spreading or colliding, forms mountains. And furthermore, neither theory gets at an even deeper question. What cataclysm sets in motion so much erosion? Well, it has to be something big, like multiple impacts on the scale of the asteroid that killed the dinosaurs. Even the academics admit it's possible. For one, the standard theories of the moon formation involve a massive impact from a Mars-sized planet called Theia. So we know that huge impacts are within the realm of possibility. But Theia was thought to hit right around the time of the Earth's formation. We'll look into that during the radiometric dating episode. But the point for now is that any evidence of Theia's impact was buried long, long ago. Even the Chicxulub crater was hard to find. So going 10 times further back into the Cambrian boundary means there'll be even less evidence available. What we know is that impacts can liquefy and flatten mountains. So it's possible a major bombardment heated the Vishnu complex rocks enough to melt them flat erasing all traces of the impact in the process. Evidence for this is piecemeal, but the same could have once been said for the existence of DNA. Exhibit A is the recent discovery of the enormous Ackerman Crater in South Australia. We're talking nearly half the size of the Chicxulub Crater. Exhibit B is the observation that when there is one impact, there very well may be more. The idea is that the solar system transits through an anisotropic galaxy, where it periodically encounters an external environment capable of destabilizing the Oort cloud that lies just beyond the heliopause. Disturbance of the cloud sends these asteroids towards the solar system, resulting in a cluster of bombardments every 30 million years or so. This means that the Ackerman crater could be the most obvious trace of an impact cluster that perhaps melted and flattened the Precambrian rocks. Moreover, multiple impacts could have easily laid the groundwork for the emergence of modern life that's observed in Cambrian sediments. Heat generated by multiple impacts could have caused the theorized rise in ocean temperatures during the Cambrian, and the erosion from the impacts could have dumped tons of sediment into the newly warmed oceans. Finally, the asteroids themselves could have seeded the Earth with cryopreserved life from a busted up planet in the Oort cloud, neatly explaining why Cambrian life looked absolutely nothing like pre-Cambrian life. When it comes to explaining geological features on Earth and throughout the solar system, scientists often invoke impact theories, which become a kind of uniformitarianism that discounts the possibility that our planet has been recently shaped by true catastrophes. Celestial events so rare as to have never occurred during the lifetime of the species. At Demystifying Science, we know that rare doesn't mean impossible and so want to propose some cosmic scenarios that require you to welcome the unlikely. After all, there's only one great unconformity, so it makes sense to search for a needle in the head. That said, what if the surface of the Earth was cooked by a solar burp, a nova from a long gone sister star, or even a hypothetical electrical event? We know that massive solar storms have visited the Earth. The Assyrians made note of them in 800 BC, the Pueblo Indians recorded them as petroglyphs almost 2,000 years later, and newspapers described the modern electrical debacle of the Carrington event. Researchers have even detected massive solar storms seven and 9,000 years ago by detecting spikes in cosmogenic radionuclides in tree rings. None of these were big enough to cook the Earth flat, but today is not yesterday. Astronomers have found young sun-like stars that give off plasma belches 10 times the size of what we observed from our own middle-aged soul. And theories of CMEs flash-melting surfaces have been around since glassy deposits were found on the surface of the moon back in the 1970s. CMEs normally just offer a harmless light show, but it's possible a young sun could have landed a direct hit if a big flare arrived during an excursion, when the Earth's magnetic field can be as little as 10% of its typical strength. Such an unfortunate coincidence is furthered by scientists suggesting a flurry of field weakening reversals may have occurred right around our mysterious Cambrian boundary, perhaps unshielding the terrestrial crust just long enough to allow a massive solar belch to slip through the goalie's legs. Another potential source for a planet-killing flare is a proximal star. And yeah, the nearest star is light years away, but what about 500 million years ago? Astronomers have found that stars are often, if not always, born in pairs. And this raises the question, why is our sun alone? Perhaps Sol's partner is wandering the galaxy, never to be reunited. But what if our partner star was around at the time of the Cambrian boundary? Binary stars are observed so close to one another as to be effectively touching. 
So it is possible a catastrophic breakdown of our local binary could have produced CME sufficient to vaporize kilometers of the crust. Or maybe the same partner star could have prematurely supernova A proposal supported by the observation of at least one relatively stable star going boom for no apparent reason. Our sister star could have gotten whacked by a passing exoplanet, leading to the greatest light show ever to grace the face of the Earth, and killing off most of the eddy-carrying creatures in the process. While all of this may be statistically unlikely, rare events have to happen somewhere. Why not here, the only planet known to have life? The crazy thing is, is that we might never know. All traces would be gone by now. The oldest visible nova, the Vela Remnant, is only 10 to 20,000 years old. That's 25,000 times less time than we need in order to be able to observe the improbable star explosion that is proposed here. So who knows? One thing is more or less clear. Half a billion years ago, something big happened that shaved off massive quantities of rock, killed off most of what came before, and seeded a whole new wing on the tree of life. A final cosmological entry in this story is championed by the Thunderbolts Project. The cause of earthly chaos was electrical. To understand the model and to see if we can apply it to our earthly conditions, let's take a short trip to the Valles Marineris, the Martian Grand Canyon. Contemporary academic theory suggests that it is a rift valley formed by the separation of tectonic plates that was subsequently carved by flowing water. If this were the case, we should expect to find large pools of fluvial sediment at the outlet to the Vallis, but there is no such sediment. In fact, the canyon doesn't even seem to have an outlet. The proposed alternative is that a highly charged body swooped past Mars, causing a planetary electric discharge in the process. The arcing has been electrically recapitulated in the laboratory by Walt Thornhill and colleagues, and in countless wood-burning videos on the internet. Unfortunately, it's not so clear-cut back home as there's a huge amount of Grand Canyon sediment in the Colorado River Delta in Southern California. But when you look at the Grand Canyon, it gives a clear impression of having been formed in at least two stages. First, the narrow channel of the Colorado, and then the much wider basin carved from the Tonto Plateau. So it's possible that an electrical catastrophe flattened and carved the Vishnu basement rocks while more uniform events shaped the upper part of the canyon in the aftermath of whatever happened. As to what could possibly cause such a powerful lightning bolt, well, our best guess is some sort of highly charged massive body or a cloud of bodies making its way across our Earth's path, perhaps tying into some of the aforementioned impact theories. In any case, the mere sight of the Vallis suggests a catastrophic geologic history in our local cosmic neighborhood. And why not? Outer space seems to have a million ways to kill you. Finally, there's Charles Hapgood's crust slip theory, also known as a cataclysmic pole shift. It's exactly what it sounds like. What if the Earth's crust slipped all at once? One of Hapgood's most compelling arguments is the presence of exceptionally well-preserved animals in the permafrost in the Siberian tundra, especially the Berezovsky mammoth. The beast was found sticking out of the permafrost on the banks of the Berezovka River in 1901, near the town of Strednikalimsk. Conventional explanations suggest the mammoth was just doing its mammoth thing when it fell off a cliff and into a muddy river bank, the same place where it was discovered 15,000 years later. Hapka didn't really like that explanation because, number one, the mammoth was still good eating, as evidenced by the fact that its freshly thawed face was eaten by a pack of wolves almost immediately. Given that freeze-thawed meat goes bad in a number of months, Hapgood concluded that the beast must have become frozen in its forever home quite suddenly. However, the condition in which it was found made it impossible for the animal to have died during an Arctic winter, the only time it could have frozen quickly enough to maintain the quality of the meat. It was A, entombed in mud, which means that the mud couldn't have been frozen when it died, and B, it had a mouthful of unchewed grass, which meant it couldn't have been winter in the Arctic Circle, and C, it had a stomach full of orchids, buttercups, and creeping thyme, none of which are compatible with a flash freeze death. Unless, of course, the mammoth woke up in one climate and died in another due to a severe pole shift that carried it from the latitude of southern Europe to a few dozen kilometers south of the Arctic Circle. Sixty years ago, Hapgood's theory was defeated by plate tectonics, the preferred uniformitarian position. But modern science is starting to come around to the idea. 
True polar wanders, slow events where the pole moves up to 30 degrees over a few tens of millions of years, are well accepted. Careers are even being made on understanding the mantle dynamics that lead to such an event. Evidence for something as catastrophic as Hapgood's vision is still thin, but the extent of polar wanders is constantly expanding, as evidenced by a 2006 paper that suggests that the poles of the Earth shifted by as much as 50 degrees, right around the time of our great unconformity. Sadly, even if there was a crust slip and the breakup of a supercontinent, we'll never know exactly what caused those calamities. Gargantuan impact, cosmic electrocution, solar chaos, perhaps the Great Unconformity is evidence of any combination of these fantastical events. Perhaps it's something we've missed altogether. So in the comments section, tell us what you think. It will never be possible to say with certainty what happened in the deep past. So perhaps the Great Unconformity is a healthy reminder that science will always be about finding what is possible rather than settling on some final and unimpeachable truth. So don't trust the science, trust yourself to know what's possible. And, and to, to support, support us, us on, on Patreon. Patreon.